that's not really got much to do with my presentation, but I just liked it. It's got, it links to a theme of, of, the, of the, uh, the findings that came out, which we'll talk about in a minute, but I just thought it was funny. So uh, I'm Osman, I'm uh, an e-learning manager at Manchester Met, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some research that I carried out for um, the Faculty of Health Psychology and Social Care on one of the online programs that they run. So uh, I'll just give you a brief background to the study itself, and then I'll go through some of the lessons that we, uh, that we, that we learned. So the, the program itself was um, an MSc Psychology Master's program, uh, which is a 12 month program, uh, and it was designed for non-psychology graduates. So what you found was that the students who were typically coming onto this program were people who had already gone through the university system, mature students, very often working full-time uh, or part-time alongside these studies, had young families. So a very different demographic from what the, the department was used to in terms of the students that were, were studying on this program. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was completely online, which was again a new thing for this faculty. They've never they didn't, they never study, they put on a, a completely online program before. And then to add to that, after the first run of the, the program in 2015, they ramped up the numbers from 13, which was essentially a pilot, all the way up to around 100 students. Um, and as you can imagine, that had huge implications for the delivery of it, the student experience. Uh, and it was at that point where I kind of uh, carried out this study, looking at the staff perspective, the student perspective, what things were, what things are like, what things were working, uh, as a means of kind of improving the program moving forward. Um, and and from that, the program's really um, kind of gone from strength to strength. After tweaks, um, kind of uh, year on year, it's now one of the most popular programs, online programs that the the, um, the university delivers. So just very quickly, the kind of approach that I took for this study um, distributed two termly st um, surveys. So these are free text comments, didn't really want to pre presuppose what students were going to be saying, letting them talk in their own language about what they thought was important. Uh, and this was a really, really di rich data set. So we had comments which were like over 300 words sometimes for each question, and the questions were on all aspects of the program. Um, and as it says, there are 350 uh, comments for each survey um, and a really good response rate around 40 percent then after analyzing those thematically we then kind of went into do a focus group with these students to really unpick okay what do we mean by these themes what is it what is it that you kind of mean by this and and really get get a real deep understanding of what the, the key themes were that was important to the students for these um, for the online program and then taking that to staff to say, right, okay, this is what, st what students are saying on the program. This is what they like, this is what's not working. What's your perspective on this? What, uh, what, what was your intention behind doing something like this? Have you thought about this? Uh, and really that kind of dialogue between staff and students was the real focus of this, of this uh, research. And then from my perspective, they're working as a, a learning technologist to look for opportunities for intervention to say, right, well, how can we, um, how can we look at this and build on the commonalities where they, where they are? And if there's disparities, look at what the causes are behind this. Why, why, are, the, why are staff thinking about certain aspects different to our students are thinking about? So before I do go into the themes of what came out, the overall themes, uh, I thought it'd be interesting just to break up the session a bit and ask for what you think might have been important on this. Um, I, I, obviously there's going to be a lot of people with the experience of either being a student or, or teaching on online programs and blended programs. But I thought if, on just rather than asking questions at this point, just on the Me Too thing, just ask maybe put a few comments on things that you think might have been important uh, and maybe then we can just have a look in and maybe a compare and contrast with what I thought, what we found in the, on the study. If I just give you a couple of minutes just to do that and I think that hopefully that'll... Uh, so if you can just put up on the screens the, the comments be really good. And if you maybe if you just talk to the person next to you and or just pop some comments. Again, just from a, what, what you think from a student perspective of what was important, what's in, what's what things are important to consider, or from a staff perspective, what are uh, important aspects to take in, into account. So if we just put that on the screen. Yeah. What's the code for me too? Is
And also, if, if, if you see a, a, to a comment that's particularly pertinent, give it a like, and then hopefully we can get those ranked, and the ones that are most popular will show up on the, on the screen. So there's quite a few comments around community, which I think this always comes up. This is always an important part. Uh, time, obviously. I think time, both from staff and student perspective, that's, always, that's something that always comes out. So what's the most popular one? Community. Yeah, I think some of the comments are coming through. The, the generic st comments that you would assume for a student, any student, but they're amplified for, for online students. So things about you know, not being able to submit online or not being able to submit at all. I think though, those kind of things, those things, anxieties really are amplified when you're online because you don't have anybody to talk to or a physical space to be able to kind of drop something in. I'll just put that up there now. These are the things that students said that there was in, that was important for them, and a lot of them have been covered here. Um, but I think one of the interesting things there about a community that it did come up in in the findings, but it wasn't a distinct theme in in itself. It was always in relation to possibly things like interaction or or wanting to feel that social presence. But the community itself, I think, because this these guys were working full-time and loads of them had kind of families and busy busy lives i think some of that took a, a back seat and the thing that really focused their attention was right i need to get my assessments in on time um, and i think sometimes a community thing was wasn't didn't play as big a part as you might do for an undergraduate um, course where you really need to feel that sense of a uh, community uh, studying but yeah I think the time one is, is something that we're going to come back to uh, in a few minutes. But yeah, I think particularly from a staff perspective, that was something that really came out, that staff didn't have time, enough time, and that, that needs to be acknowledged of the amount of time that goes into to developing an online program. But what I thought I'd do now is just go through a few kind of mini case studies of some of the findings. Obviously, it wouldn't be possible to go through all of them. But these are the overall kind of findings of, of what the students found important. And again, I think a lot of them are covered here. Things like support, academic support, pastoral support. Um, that covers things like timeliness of communications, which I think was one of, the, one, of the, one of the comments here as well. Interaction of learning. So that, that again, their interaction with peers and students. So I mean, it's, it's all, and, and, and I think it, with a room like this, some of these things are, might seem obvious and common sense, but I'm in an institution where some of these things, you know, aren't very obvious to, to certain people. So I think part of this conversation needs to be that these, the right kinds of people need to kind of hear this information, I guess. Uh, and that's some of the things, again, I'll talk about in a minute. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the individual unit areas. So students talked about the fact that they, they were getting inf inconsistent units um, within the, each one of their learning spaces. They were having inconsistent information. It was labeled differently. Uh, sometimes assessments were located in different spaces. Uh, and because these guys were time poor, we all know that they, you, know, you don't have enough time to be able to get your assignments in on time, never mind search for contact details or, or trying to find the, the, the weekly activities that week. Uh, and that often meant that important information was sometimes missed. But from a staff perspective, they kind of countered that by saying, well, there was a lot of information that staff, that they had to give to students, things around ex exceptional factors or the elective units or all that kind of information had to be given to students. And because they were in online and they were in that week, they had to kind of give all that information in one go. An interesting other th another thing was about the, some of the tutors talking about the fact that they, were free, they felt constrained by this, having to have this consistency with other units. Uh, they weren't able to kind of teach in a fluid manner as they might be able to in a face-to-face -face environment. 
So some of them relied on this kind of almost serendipity of, of when you're teaching some of the things just kind of the penny drops, but you weren't able to kind of build that into a, an online session, some of the tutors felt, uh, and having to kind of front load all your, your, your resources at the beginning of term really made that difficult. Now, from my perspective, trying to take a neutral, neutral role in this, it was really obvious that all of the, the, the staff comments were relating to their own unit areas. Um, and that thing that, that's kind of carried over from the way that it's taught in a face-to-face -face environment. But in Moodle, each unit area has each his own unit leader who has ownership of that unit. But they, they, they take care of their own unit, but they don't necessarily think about the whole program as a whole. Um, and we all know students see a single program, not individual unit areas. So my role was to kind of think about that whole program level thinking. Um, and I did that by kind of incorporating Moodle templates um, to try to bring in that consistency across the different unit spaces, but also leaving them flexible enough for different tutors to be able to kind of build on their own kind of style of teaching into it and make it easy enough for their own subject matter to be incorporated into those templates. Um, this idea of just enough information and just enough time to stagger the information, to say, okay, well, you don't need to know about assessments at, on your first day or Harvard referencing or whatever it might be. Uh, and we picked points in the, in the term where we thought this would be more pertinent for the, for, the, for the students to be able to access that information and obviously make it available and signpost to it, but not to bombard them with all of that information at the outset. Um, now, it, these kinds of things that, that, that have happened here, it's, they're ongoing issues. Inserting a template is not a quick fix. You can't just say, right, everything's done now. Templates can be broken, they can be ignored, they can, you know, you can, you can apply a, 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 a consistent template inconsistently. I think it's an ongoing thing of being able to kind of work with the tutors to say, well, this is what's working here, that's not what's working there, and that more iterative approach. And similarly with that idea of just enough information, just enough time, just to, that can mean different things to, to, different, to different tutors. So again, just working, working with them really to, to get that overall cohesiveness to the program and really thinking about what the online journey should look like for, for the student. Feedback on formative activities. So students talked about not having a, a enough personalized feedback or wanting to have that kind of validation of their opinions and just making sure that they were understanding the material correctly as they were moving through the program. Uh, as you can imagine, staff were concerned about the amount of work that would be required responding individually to 80 or 90 students on a weekly basis. Um, and they also talked about the fact that some of these students were carrying over their, their experiences of undergraduate studies over to, face to, uh, over to the level seven master's level and where they needed to be a bit more independent in their, in their approach. But I think ultimately what's happened here is that students, well staff had a, were in a situation where they knew a group of students very intimately, 13 students, and then that same pedagogic model was used for um, a group of 100 students where it was unrealistic for them to be able to know that them kinds of students um, very well, being able to engage with them in the same way. Um, and I think that is really speaks to the, the people who are in charge of resourcing the, the program. So the scale up of it really, it was, it was assumed that staff would just do more of the same. The program had been set up in the first instance, the resources had been created, now we can just let it run. Um, and really, when you, re when you scale up a program from 13 to 100, you really need to either increase the, the staff resource appropriately, or you can choose to um, change the pedagogic model to then fit the, the resource that's, um, that you currently have. Um, but mechanisms like discussion forums, if you're using that with a group of 10 or 15 students, you, that, that's unrealistic that you're going to be able to use those kinds of same mechanisms um, on uh, a bigger program with the same staff resource. So I think that was one of the issues that, um, so, so the, ultimately the approach was taken to kind of modify the, 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 the way that the, the program worked 
to introduce more automated ways of feed feeding back. So um, things like quizzes, uh, where you had that personalized feedback uh, for, for students, but also workbook activities where you had that focused interaction with, with, a, piece of, with a piece of reading. But importantly, expectation management, both from students of how, um, what, what it takes to, to, to come on a program, what kind of interaction you can expect, but for, for staff as well. So this is what, it, what online learning looks like, uh, particularly for those outside of the department who are unfamiliar with this type of teaching. Um, you know, there's, there's sometimes that assumption that, well, you can just put it all online and leave them to it, or that it's a, a cost-saving exercise. Um, and again, I mean, I think one of the big draws of this program was that you were able to reach students who previously couldn't have come to university full-time and studied on a program like this. And I think treating it as something where you can, where you can save money or time, I think, is, 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 is probably not the best way to look at it. So those kinds of messages need to, I think, be articulated. And just very finally, webinars. Um, this was part of the overall interaction um, theme. But things that we've kind of come out in, in, in some of these comments as well to do with the social aspect of learning and students talking about the fact that they weren't able to you know, they felt sometimes isolated from the university. And these webinars were really, really good tools. They loved the fact that they could see other students, they could talk to them in real time, and really had that human interaction. But the fact that they didn't go far enough, or some of them weren't as interactive as they would have liked. Um, and staff talked about the fact that there were a lot, of, a lot of students, that they weren't able to have those kind of interactions uh, as personalized as they would have liked. Um, Sometimes it was students who would dominate discussions, which made it difficult to, again, have those uh, very interactive kind of discussion type sessions. But ultimately, this speaks to the, to the, to the same point in the fact that um, you, you, you scale up the program and then you need to kind of deal with the fact that interaction needs to change. You can't have the same kinds of uh, interactions based on a, a previous pedagogic model. Um, and also the fact that the other thing that came out of this was that staff acknowledged that these, these webinars sometimes weren't as engaging as they should have been, but they didn't have the time to, to plan. Um, you know, so, I mean, you need to have a, a, a session plan, you need to plan for these kinds of interactions. Uh, and if that's not acknowledged by the powers that be of what resources required for, for delivering this program, then you can't expect them to plan these sessions in, uh, particularly for those who are new to this type of, uh, of uh, delivery. So staff development sessions were, were put on and we kind of we talked about how we might be able to deliver webinars to larger scale um, numbers. But again, if staff don't have time to, to either attend or to implement that, it's questionable whether there's any merit in delivering those staff development sessions. One of the things that we did do was to um, develop more uh, webinars around assessments. Um, that was to counter the fact that some students felt quite vulnerable online. They weren't able to engage if they felt uncomfortable with the fact that they, the knowledge of these webinars being recorded uh, and their own lack of understanding as it was to be broadcast to the whole group. And so if they were talking about something that was more personal to them and they had more experience around, they'd be able to open up a lot more and facilitate those discussions uh, in, a, in a more engaging way. So just very finally, some of the lessons that we took away from, from delivering this program. That overall program level thinking is key, I think. Uh, and my role in that, in um, putting those templates together, working with academic staff, trying to sell the idea that these templates are a, are a good idea, and, and also selling them in a way that's beneficial to staff as well. So we are saving staff time. You don't need to populate your Moodle areas every single year. Um, and I think that that's, that's quite, that's an important aspect of it, trying to win the hearts and minds of, of people you're working with. Um, as, as I think Laurie mentioned as well, you can't, this, it's not about kind of imposing anything on anyone. Um, the scaling up, again, there's that, that option of having um, either you maintain that staff student ratio and you scale up or you fundamentally change the pedagogic model. Uh, and it's un unrealistic to be able to um, scale up without having one of those two options. And the misconceptions, again, this workload is always a concern for staff, but as long as the, um, the 
as long as it's understood what online learning is, then that resource can be built into workload models and how we want this online learning program to work. If it's just going to be a case of putting all the resources out online and leaving students to it, then essentially you've got a, um, a different, uh, another version of a MOOC. Um, and that's not what I think a lot of people want. And you're going to eventually you know, get the drop-off rates that you might get on a MOOC as well. So I think you really need to, that needs to be articulated for the people who are in charge of resourcing these areas and these, uh, these programs to kind of articulate this is a, what an online program looks like and this is the resource that's involved. Um, hopefully that's been useful. That brings my presentation to a close. And I'm more than happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Osman. I'm, I've spent most of the last 20 years working for the Open University and so much of that was familiar, although I think you've got some really helpfully articulated comments both from staff and students and it really ties in with I think what Amber was saying in her keynote about we keep talking about this stuff because the practice is continually evolving. Um, so do we have any questions in the room? I'm looking hard at my former Open University colleagues who must have something to say about this. No? They're all hiding now. I mean, that, that, this is an interesting one at the top that, that, that resonates with me from my experience. Why did they have to have it already at the start? Was that due to students having to be able to self-pace their studies? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I think part of it was their conception of what online learning was. So it was sold to them in a way where everything had to be ready beforehand. And that kind of, I guess, was carried over from the way that they taught this program in a face-to-face -face environment um, and where they already had all the lectures in place so, yeah, I mean, there's no reason why it had to be ready week on week, but I think that idea of consistency ties in with the fact that things are organised in, organised in a certain way. So, if you had certain weeks that were certain unit areas which did have all their content ready uh, together, then it was assumed that every single other area would have to do the same thing. Okay, so what changes would you make to the pedagogic model and might students be able to cope with that? Um, so, as I mentioned, we, we, we introduced um, a lot more kind of automated feedback, but we also made use of the forums where discussion was happening. So they had another uh, unit called professional, personal professional development in which they were split up into their uh, peer learning groups. Um, so we, we directed a lot of the discussion there. So although we made some of the communication a bit more didactic in terms of question and answer, some of the other forums that were actually being used, we, we kind of we, we shifted some of the discussion there. So I think it's dangerous to say, well, we can automate all feedback because I think that's not going to be possible and we don't want to run a program like that. But I think it's to make use of those, those areas where discussion was already happening to kind of introduce and say, well, this week's topic was on X, Y, Z. Maybe this week we can, we can have a separate discussion forum within your forum group um, to just highlight some of the issues or some of the things that we've taken away this week. So I think that's one of the things that we did. Um, the webinars, again, I think people love that, that, that real life interaction. So as much as possible to have that, we, we had things like uh, having intro videos Again, it sounds like a small thing, but just having a, a face and a person saying, hello, welcome to the unit, this is what we're doing. I think when you're on, online, I think it helps a lot more bring, uh, bring a bit more of a human feel to it. So there's another question kind of related to that. Did other synchronous models come up, such as Skype chat or Google Hangout, to encourage free conversation? Um, so we, we did use, we, we ran our webinars through Adobe Connect, so that, but they were... Um, the students had their own groups as well, so they would be communicating with each other in social kind of environments, um, things like Google Hangouts where they would arrange their own uh, meetings. But apart from the webinars and the kind of formal program committee meetings and things like that with student reps, we didn't have any other, any other kind of synchronous communication. And I think that was probably kind of more characteristic of the, the student body than anything else because, you know, we had people in different time zones, we had people who were different work shifts and I think it would be very difficult to try to get everybody together um, in, in a synchronous way. We've got a couple of questions about um, kind of peer-to-peer -peer engagement. 
So was peer assessment considered and are online students more resistant to peer feedback? So we did, in the dissertation unit, we introduced uh, an informal peer, peer assessment um, um, yeah, peer assessment activity where you could look at each other's proposals. Uh, and that went down really well. Um, I think some of the, the, the issues with it were probably, that probably weren't uh, particularly individual to the online delivery. It was more to do with the students who were uncomfortable with the fact that they were uh, giving other people their access to their, their their assignments, they weren't sure about how to assess it, but equally we did get some good feedback about people being more comfortable with the assessment criteria. Um, in terms of the resistance, I don't, I don't think they were any, any more resistant than, any, than I would have expected, to be honest. Okay, um, I think you mentioned that you, you were working in a particular discipline, yeah. so is the kind of template you had from that scalable to other? Areas? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the now got a few um, online programs in that faculty, uh, and the this this was kind of seen as a, the template in terms of how delivery was worked. So, yeah, I think um, this the original model was really heavily based on these weekly formative activities, um, and I think that was unrealistic given that resource. So, the, the it was tweaked. Although there was some version of that, it wasn't kind of a direct discussion forum and, and a webinar every single week, uh, and that was tweaked. But a version of that is now being rolled out and used uh, on other online programs in that faculty. Okay. Someone's asked about Jilly Salmon's eTivities model. Yeah. Was that relevant, helpful, used? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That was. I mean, when I talked about that staggering of information, that was one of the key drivers of that. So really, in that first week, we just focused on getting them online. Uh, whereas in the first, previously in the first run of it, we kind of looked at, right, this is all you need to know about assessments, this is all you need to know about everything else. Whereas, look, kind of reflecting on what Jenny Salmon does in her model, just looking at the first week as, right, we're getting them online, getting them comfortable with engaging with us. We're going to look at how to communicate. This is the emails that you need to know. Uh, and really making sure they're comfortable online and then moving over to um, the academic side of things. And I think that's reflected in, in Jenny Salmon's model as well. So it's come up at quite a few sessions over the last three days about getting senior management teams on board. So someone has asked, how were your key points received by the leadership? Um, really, I think really well. I mean, I think I had a really good relationship with them. Uh, I think a lot of people probably um, have a, a similar role in terms of being a learning technologist. And I think one of the things that uh, is, a, is a good good thing to have in your toolbox is, is that goodwill that you have with a lot of people because you help so many people and so many things. So when you are in a position where you articulate something that might be a bit of a difficult conversation, it's taken in the, in the right way. Um, and you're not kind of there to add any work to anything or you're just you're looking at things in the right perspective. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's always a work in progress. Even if people do acknowledge it, there's always a, a but that comes in at some point, uh, but this, but that. So, but, but yeah, I think, um, and as, as I mentioned, the program did increase, and that part of that increase was because it was supported, um, and it was kind of um, acknowledged that this, the, the, the invisibility of the workload that staff were, were putting into this um, needed to be addressed. So that was acknowledged to some extent. The last question has just come in. I don't know if you have an answer to this. Are online tutors born or made? <laughs> well, I have to say made because uh, I think it's, it's, quite, it's quite depressing not to say both. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I, I, think, I think online tutors are not no different to, to if, if you can hold a, a good teaching session, I think it, it's, it's a very few minor tweaks that need, that need to happen for you to do that in an online space. So, you know, a good teacher would be able to facilitate a room uh, and facilitate discussion. When you do that online, obviously there's a, some technical knowledge that needs to, be, that needs to go into it, but essentially, it's the pedagogy which is leading it. Um, so I think with the question probably could be um, are tutors born or are tutors uh, um, born or made? Because I think essentially the, the online side of things I think is, is a very small step once you acknowledge and understand what, what the online space is like. I think that's a perfect place to finish. So <laughs> thank you again for your excellent talk and thanks again to Donna and Lauren. So you've now got a half hour refreshment break.
I'm John Wilson, I'm the CEO at Agenta. We're a technology company that focuses on education and learning. We build, manage and operate platforms for education, for video collaboration. Externally we prefer to work with what we feel as ethical industries. Um, obviously education, teaching, learning, healthcare. We feel that we can really contribute to these industries by creating exciting platforms, um, easy to use platforms, secure platforms that people can utilise. What we feel is one of the most important things for Scotland to boost economic growth uh, is investing in rural areas. By investing in uh, broadband in these local areas we can attract more talent, we can attract more companies and we can drastically improve the delivery of education and learning within these schools within disparate regions within Scotland.